have an abortion. My, I went to that first ultrasound appointment and I heard that little sound that you hear, that fast 150 beat a minute little sound, a whipping noise. That sound to me was proved to me that I had a human being inside of me. She chose life for her baby daughter, who today is a 25-year-old woman and college graduate. Joining us now on Skype for this week's Pro-Life Focus is South Carolina State Representative Melissa Lackey Aramis. Melissa, welcome and wow, powerful testimony about how you were pregnant at 16 years old. Here we are today. You're obviously a successful woman, a state representative. What's your message to young women who also find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy and who may think finding success won't be possible? Hey, thank you for having me. I just really want girls to know, young girls that find themselves pregnant, to know that abortion should not be an option. Um, your life is going to be a little bit harder, harder with a baby. Um, it's going to make you have to work a little harder, but you can do it. And, you know, abortion should not even be an option. We mm -hmm. should not even say, you know, give someone an option to, to do an abortion. If you know, you just have to let them know that there's other options out there, you know, and that includes adoption. Mm. You shared about choosing life for your daughter after hearing her heartbeat. South Carolina's heartbeat law is currently suspended, but why do you think this law is important for women? Um, I think it's important because we need to quit just saying that it's about women's health care. And we are, you know, taking a woman's right to choose a way so she can have all these health care. If, if I had a doctor tell me that I needed to abort my child, he wouldn't be my doctor anymore. So it's important for women to know that there's other options out there. We, we do not have to, to end it this way. So for South Carolinians, we wanted to let the world know that we stand up for life here. And I just pray that our court systems um, will follow suit in the Supreme Court. It was a very personal testimony you shared on the South Carolina House floor last week. Was that difficult to share and why did you ultimately decide it was important to do? I was not prepared. Um, I didn't have anything written down, but I just decided to tell my story. Um, I just prayed about it the night before and said, I think just telling who I am might be a better testimony than having all these things written down. So I. I, like I said, I didn't have anything planned and it just came out the way it did. And I did not realize it was going to touch and inspire so many women. So many people have reached out to me saying they wish they had had me in their corner, um, championing them along the way um, so they wouldn't have had to make that decision. So that's been pretty powerful. And tell us about your daughter today. I understand she's 25, year old, 25 years old yes, now. She is. Wow, tell us about yes, her. Yes, she is. She now, like I said, she's a college graduate. She's living in New York City and loves it there. She's a very independent woman. She's an entrepreneur. She um, is in fashion field and she is planning to launch a swim line come this spring. So we're very proud of her. She is um, headstrong like her mom. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but she has watched, watched me along the way and, and be an independent person and so I'm very proud of the Christian strong woman she is today. Your speech did get a lot of attention. What's your message to people who think the heartbeat bill and pro-life laws are anti-woman? Um, I, I really want women to stop saying that. Um, people keep saying to me, you had a choice, you had a choice. Really, I didn't. I, um, I wish nobody would have ever spoke those words to me, but I don't want women to think that's their only option. There should not be an option. Um, when two people consent to um, have sexual relations and a baby comes to be part of it, then there there is no um, second guess in that. That's a life inside of you and God placed it there and it's up to you to take care of that responsibility. So I, I don't even think abortion should be an option and so we can just end that conversation altogether. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your vulnerability and sharing your own personal witness and for your courage. South Carolina State Representative Melissa Lackey Aramis, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. 
were there. You can also send us a message by emailing ProLifeWeekly at EWTN.com. We love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless. There is nothing like this show on TV. It's a really exciting opportunity to talk about our faith, talk about the news, talk about where those two things intersect. Finding the real person, the real Catholic, and talking to them about what matters to them. And I hope that this show will dig deep into that question about who we are as people and who we are as Catholics and how we can confidently live our faith in the world. EWTN News in Depth. Engaged, informed, Catholic. Premiering Friday, March 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern here on EWTN. The great dignity of the human body is an essential part of the way God made human nature. As Catholics, we believe in the resurrection of the body as professed in the Creed. In his new miniseries, Dr. Scott Hahn explores questions of life, death, and resurrection. This mystery of life and death is what Christians face every day, but especially at the final hour. It's a revelation of human dignity from conception until natural death and beyond. Hope to Die, a five-part miniseries on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. EWTN, live truth, live Catholic. I'm Father Mitch Paquin. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, a program where we take a look at the teachings of sacred Scripture through the apostolic tradition that goes back to the apostles and ultimately to Christ. And we'd love to have you be part of the show. You can do so by adding questions or comments during the live program, which is Tuesday, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. And you can call in. If you're in North America, the phone number is 1-800-221-9460. If you are not in North America, that number won't work. So you can call country code 1, area code 205, Two seven one two nine eight zero, or you can send us questions and comments by email to Scripture and Tradition at ewtn.com, or through our social media pages like Facebook or YouTube. Now, if you missed last week's Scripture and Tradition show or any past episode, you can go to EWTN's YouTube page and watch it whenever you want. Just go to youtube.com slash EWTN. Now today, we're going to talk about some things that seem obvious but are very important and basic. Namely, don't go to hell and do go to heaven. That's pretty basic. But we need to deal with some of that in order to be able to better discern the will of God. If you are using my book, we're starting on page 30. My book is called How to Listen When God is Speaking. 
a guide for modern day Catholics. And of course, you can still get that at EWTNRC.com. It is item number 1833. All right, so let's take a look where we left off. We're talking about how important it is for us to integrate every aspect of life and pull together the various elements of our lives. You want your life to be a unified whole and not different compartments. You want it to be, take, take its own shape. And one of the issues is that we have these different areas of life. They are distinct areas, but they are not hard and fast compartments. Our moral life on the personal level, our political life, our business life, our sexual life, our family life, all of these need to be brought together by God, where God is the one we love above everything else. We love him first. And when we put God first, we then learn to put a hierarchy of values. There are lots of values in life, but we learn from God. And by having him at the center of our lives, we learn what is the priority value? What things can I say that's not as important and this is more important? It's not easy for a lot of people to decide that. And this is something that God helps us to do. And this is where we prayerfully reflect on the various aspects of life so that we can bring God into every aspect, every component of life. That's what our prayer and reflection does. It needs to bring God into each and every component of life. Business is not distinct from God, and politics is not distinct from God. Not that we want the politicians to be promoting our religion or any other religion. That's something else. But in our own decision-making about politics, we have to integrate our values into our faith in God so that he puts the proper priorities in business, politics, family, sex, all these, entertainment, all these different things. Now, we have to keep in mind the Lord is very interested in our family life. We talked early on about being made in the image and likeness of God and that one aspect of being in God's image and likeness is that we belong to other persons and they belong to us. We're in this relationship with each other. That goes against a lot of our cultural values where everybody wants to be their own individual. And uh, apart from everything to do what they want for themselves on their own merits and on their own uh, decision making. But God really does create us to, for family. We come from family, God willing, and we're created to help form family. Even those of us who are celibate, we priests, we're called father. We're, we're not physical fathers but we are to be spiritual fathers for our parishes and other communities. And what we want to do is see God enter our family life. So our family should pray together, not only by going to Mass together on Sundays, but on a daily basis, saying grace before we eat meals, taking a few minutes to pray together as a family. You start that early in your family, and your children will treat it as absolutely normal. God is also interested in our finances. What kind of work do we do? How diligently do we work? How much responsibility do we show for 
the way we work for our money? How do we deal with rewarding our co-workers, our employers, employees? Do we give our employers an honest day's work for the pay they give us? And do employers give their workers an honest day wage? This is a very important. How do we treat the company property? You know, I, we can say, oh, it belongs to the company. They have insurance. It's no big deal. Or do we show responsibility for it? You know, we, we talk a lot about the importance of the environment, and we should. Environment is a wonderful thing to keep beautiful and clean and, you know, ready for the next generation. And so we don't want to waste corporate resources or personal resources. We have to keep in mind, especially in this culture, God is very concerned about our sexuality. How is it directed towards its purpose, which is the procreation of life? That's his primary purpose. How is it oriented toward its secondary purpose, which is the love between a man and a woman, a husband and wife, not just any man and any woman, but your own husband and your own wife. And that this has to be integrated. That's why marriage is a sacrament. And of course, that entails the first commandment that God gave Adam and Eve, which is to be fruitful and multiply. When he gave that commandment, he was not giving us a math problem. Being you know, the ability to multiply is an important aspect of our sexuality, and it's something that he wants under his direction and guidance. All of these aspects of life need to be integrated, they have to be kept in proper priorities. Family is more important than work. Work is extremely important and has some demands upon us. But our, our own uh, family life is more important than the, the life at work. And as I heard one man in his mid-50s who had cancer, and didn't, he didn't look like he was going to make it. I wasn't able to follow up on him, but he was saying on the television show, he said, you know, now that I have cancer and I, you know, I know that my end is coming sooner than I expected, I am not thinking about, oh, Lord, give me just one more day in the office. That's not his prayer. His prayer was, let me see my children more. That got at this issue of putting a higher priority on our families and on our jobs and certainly on getting toys. A lot of people will say and have said to me over the years, well, I don't want kids. They're so expensive. I, I, there's some toys I want to get for myself, big boat and things like that. Well, the boat's going to break. And if you do have a deathbed, um, you won't be going to the boat for consolation. They won't help you. They won't change your bedpan. All right. Now, that's this role of integration. We then have to realize that when we make God our number one goal in life, and when we seek not to compartmentalize, that is, we don't want to put everything into little compartments. Here's the job, here's the politics, here's work, here's family, here's sexuality, here's uh, recreation. That compartmentalization is not our goal. Integration is. When we have that underway, and make that a goal, that God is number one in our lives, and he integrates our whole life. Next goal. How do I make sure I go to heaven to be with God for all eternity? And at the same time, how do I avoid going to hell? Very important questions. I know it sounds obvious, 
And it's one of those things that you say, well, why are you talking about this? Of course I want to go to heaven. Well, you know, this is something that we have to keep in mind. Um, there's a problem with a lot of us clergy. I met a young lady on an airplane once back in the mid-90s. She happened to sit next to me. And she said, oh, yeah, I was raised Catholic, but I stopped going because, you know, all that I ever heard from the priest was preaching about hellfire and damnation. And I was wondering, who is that priest? I, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to meet this guy because by that point in the mid-90s, I hadn't heard many sermons about hellfire or damnation. I don't know. Uh, well, I take that back. I did hear it from some of my sermons. In fact, one of my priest friends, you know, called me once after I was talking about hell on this, this program. And uh, I, I, when we were doing a Threshold of Hope version of it, and he said, you've got to stop talking about hell so much. They'll never make you a bishop. And I said, well, if that's all it takes, I'm going to double it. So I did, and they haven't made me a bishop. <laughs> that's one way to get out of it. Um, this is something that we don't hear much from priests. They don't talk about hell. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's good. And one of the things that I observe in life, especially around October, right before Halloween, is that we priests don't talk about hell. And instead, Hollywood makes all of these horror films. They char, I don't even know what they, I haven't been to one movie in the last couple of years. Um, uh, I think I went to one, uh, but it was a World War I movie. And other than that, I haven't gone. And uh, I know that it's $12 or some places more than that, $15, $20 even. People will pay that to go see a horror film. I, 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 I don't watch those things. Matter of fact, I don't even like watching the previews. Every time I did see a preview, of an upcoming horror movie, I would just put that on my checklist. Well, that's one more movie I'm not going to see. I just don't like those things. But they portray this hellishness so that as we priests don't speak about hell, Hollywood does. And they come up with all these movies and they charge more. I mean, a lot of people just give five bucks to, you know, on the Sunday collection. Uh, even though they can, they pay more to go to the movies. And this is uh, something that we priests did at a bargain rate, but we don't do it anymore. I, I think that we need to have a balance about preaching about hell so that we do help people avoid that true, truest in the deepest sense, pitfall. We don't want people to, to do that. And I've met a few people who have said to me that, uh, like, like in, the, in some of the uh, uh, horror movies, uh, one of the lines that you see and uh, I've seen in some of the previews is, I'll see you in hell. I don't look upon that as a very cheery prospect. I don't know why they do. You know, uh, maybe Hollywood is just projecting their own future fate onto their characters. That's so often what they do in other movies. Um, but I've met people in life. I'll never forget one young man, a teenager, who hated his parents. And he was starting to come around to faith. He had been... Uh, interested in demon worship. He, he, was, he was engaged in it when I met him and, um, you know, sort of talked him into coming to uh, a teenage prayer group in Cincinnati back in those days. And when his mother came and enjoyed the prayer group, 
he was furious. And he said, I'm going to hell and I'm taking her with me. Um, we had a little conversation about that, and I think I managed to talk him out of it. And some of the young ladies in the group prayed for him uh, to get out of that mentality. But, you know, this is an attitude. Or I, another woman I met who said, well, I know I'm going to hell, but I don't think I want to change or can change my way of life. So that's just the way it is. And other people who think that, uh, you know, going to hell is um, where their friends are going to be, so they want to be there with them. Well, you know, I don't think that's a good idea either. You know, maybe your friends will be there. I don't know. I can't judge them. God will judge them of that. But I guarantee you, if your friends are in hell, and if you join them, you will spend all of eternity blaming each other for getting there. And in fact, you will end up being part of the torment of each other's hell. You will be part of the torture as well as being tortured by each other. You won't love anybody. Nobody in hell can love the other demons. It is a place of total hatred and irresponsibility. If you think that Congress and the news media spend a lot of time blaming their opponents for what goes wrong in society, wait till you go to hell. If you think that they're blaming each other now, in hell, they'll blame each other even more and they won't stop. So this is something that we don't want to even desire or give ourselves room for. We should have total revulsion at the idea of going to hell and look upon that as something absolutely horrible. It's not a cartoon experience. It's a, imagine the worst people you knew who hated you and rejected you and that in hell you'd be surrounded only by those people. That would be a good way to experience the abject anger, loneliness, and rejection that hell would be, not to mention the other torments of mind and body. So this is something that we want to avoid. Now, there are a few more things for us to consider about this decision not to go to hell. So we're going to take a break, and we'll come back and deal with a few of those elements, so please stay with us. Hello, family. As Catholics, we're obligated to attend Mass every Sunday. Sadly, during the past year, most of us were unable to go regularly because of coronavirus restrictions and our churches being closed. But for those who are homebound due to age, illness, or injury, this is nothing new. Every day, EWTN makes it possible for tens of thousands of people who are homebound to experience the Mass. We hear from countless people, young and old, who are grateful for the opportunity to receive spiritual blessings through the Mass that's available on TV, internet, and radio. Because of your generous support, EWTN is able to reach out to those who are hungry for daily Mass, the Holy Rosary, programs that teach about the saints and the sacraments, news from a faithful Catholic perspective, and so much more. This is why I hope you'll make a donation today. Your gift will help us share the beauty of the Church with those who need it most. May God bless you. 
EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Please make a gift today by going to EWTN.com forward slash daily mass online. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama 35210. St. Joseph, Light of Patriarchs, pray for us. The Litany of St. Joseph on EWTN. Right, so we're talking a little bit about the decision to this not want to go to hell and making a clear-cut decision. There are a number of people in our society who subscribe to the theme of the feature-length cartoon series, All Dogs Go to Heaven, Part 1 and Part two, MGM did that, uh, those two feature-length movies. And it fits the mentality of a certain group that says, well, God would never send anybody to hell. God is so loving, he wouldn't send anybody there. And, and I've even heard some people say, well, actually, you know, Jesus didn't really talk much about this, it was St. Paul who got into this judgmental attitude about hell. And I just don't have to accept what Paul says. Well, first of all, that doesn't fit the facts. St. Paul never once mentioned hell. It's not in any of his epistles. Not once. What he does teach in a couple of different places is that if people commit certain sins what, that we would today call mortal sins, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. It says, don't you, uh, I'll, I'll read that to you. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he says, do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you used to be. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the spirit of our God. Notice he says it twice. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. What you will inherit, draw your own conclusion. If you don't go to God, draw your own conclusions. But he doesn't mention hell explicitly. In fact, who is it that does mention hell? Most of all in the New Testament and it is Jesus Christ. And the place where he seems to mention it the most is in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, there's a lot of people who say, and even some of our politicians, even our Catholic politicians, will say, oh, I love the Sermon on the Mount. This is the Jesus that I cling to and not the judgmental. Well, um, uh, I don't know the last time you read the Sermon on the Mount or what parts you read and what parts you skipped, but he mentions hell more often there. Um, uh, you end up in Gehenna, which is the, the term they use for hell. Um, you, know, you see, for instance, in Matthew 5, 22, 
where it says, But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother and sister, you will be liable to the council. If you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. And the word that they use for fool there, raqqa, raqqa means, uh, uh, it's a term for fool that's particularly strong. And it's some, in some of the communities in the Middle East, that term is still used. And it, it'll cause a blood feud for generations to, to say that. That's why it's so, so bad. People would uh, kill each other for generations. That's not the only place. Uh, take a look at Matthew 5.25 where he says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So uh, that's, that doesn't sound good. Um, also, we see in Matthew 27, uh, our Lord said, You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. So he says, you know, uh, lust, you know, and they didn't have the pornography industry that we do now. But this is one of the reasons why uh, pornography is so serious. Our Lord says it is. It's a very serious sin, and it can bring a person down to hell. Now, it's not only the Sermon on the Mount. Our Lord's parables speak of condemnation for all eternity. For instance, in Matthew 13, 24 to 30, we see the parable of the weeds and the wheat. The weeds are burned in a fire that never goes out. And the wheat are gathered into barns. It's a sign of hell and heaven. In chapter 13, verses 47 to 50, when he says that the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown to the sea, caught every kind of fish. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, put the good fish into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age that angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then we see um, in our Lord's parables of the uh, last judgment in Matthew 24 and 25 that the, uh, uh, he asked this rhetorical question, who then is the faithful and wise slave? whom his master put in charge of his household to give other slaves their allowance of food at the proper time. Blessed is that slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Do I tell you who put that one in charge of all his possessions? But if that wicked slave says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eats and drinks with the drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, that's pretty serious. Same thing with the five wise and five foolish virgins in Matthew 25, 1 to 13. The fools are left outside in the dark, and the Lord says, go away. I never knew you. And then with the, uh, the, the servant who hid a talent, he's called lazy and evil. And he's thrown into the outer darkness with his wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
And then I've even heard politicians who say, oh, I love the Jesus of Matthew 25, 31 and following, the, the, the parable uh, where G, uh, of the goats and the sheep, where the sheep are the ones who take care of, the, feed the hungry and the thirsty and visit the sick and the imprisoned and the lonely and give them clothes and all that. That's the part I like. But they forget that people who neglect to do that will also go to hell. You know, this is, this is what Christ taught in the Sermon on the Mount, the parables of the kingdom, and the parables of the uh, final judgment. And this hell does not have fellowship, friendship, and love. It is hatred, and only hatred, and a lack of community, radical Individualism is hell. You, all the individuals in hell will be radically separated from one another. And what we have to do then is remember all this. Remember all this. And say about our own lives, do I want to go to hell or not? If I don't, then I have to let my decision not to go to hell motivate me. You know, is, um, people will say, well, I don't want to be motivated in a negative way. Well, I tell you what, in my own life, there have been plenty of times I avoided mortal sin, not because I'm such a good guy, not because I'm virtuous, but because I don't want to fry in hell. I don't want to go through that pain. That's not the best motive. I admit that. But if that is enough motive to keep me from doing something evil, that's fine. Eventually, I may learn to like virtue and goodness. And that, that will sustain my motives. But I think that we do well to avoid hell as a starting point and then move from that to a more sincere uh, uh, sense of understanding the virtue I want to do. That will be what, what we want to deal with. All right, we will pick up on this theme next week, and we'll be taking a look at page 33 in my book next week. So you know, this will be enough for us to think about for a few days, and what I'd like to start doing is going to some of your questions. We're going to start off with the caller. We have Mike on the line. Mike, where are you calling from? Mike, are you there? I don't hear him. Oh, so I don't, I guess we don't have her. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, we'll see if we get back to him. Uh, we'll take an email from a lady named Molly. Hi, Father Paco. My question pertains to the state of a priest during Mass. Our parish priest and the parish deacon seem to have a running feud that sometimes spills over to Mass. What are they, Hatfield and McCoy? I know they're human, and they have human frailties, but at the times you feel the tension in the air during Mass, and you can see them visibly annoyed with each other. Does it hurt the priest's ability to change the host to the holy body of Jesus when he is angry as he's doing it? I am truly receive. Am I truly receiving Jesus at this time? Thank you for your help, Molly. Molly, this is a very important question, and in fact, it was asked early in the church. There was a heretic named Novation, and then there was another one. He, he didn't start this, but his name applies to the movement. Uh, his name was Donatus and his followers were called Donatists. Um, and 
this, uh, the teaching then was, if a priest had in weakness betrayed the faith during the persecutions by the Romans, did that invalidate his sacraments? And this was something the church had to think through, but the answer was no, because the sacrament does not depend on the holiness of the priest, but it depends on the power of Jesus Christ. The sacraments are rooted in the death and resurrection of Christ not in the personal ability of the priest. Thanks be to God for that. And this is a very important thing. And eventually they came up with a Latin phrase that summarized it, that the sacraments are powerful ex opere operato, that this is done by the work that has been done by Christ. That's the implied part of that. So this is uh, something that is guaranteed by God's grace, not the priest's personality. Now, does this feud affect their celebration? Yes, and they will be answerable to it. Um, maybe you and some of the other uh parishioners uh, could get together and go to both of them and say, look, you too, knock it off. You know, this, do you make, do you think it's easier for me to pray because you're ticked off at him and he's ticked off at you? No way. So let them know that they, because there is the effect of the priest's devotion, in this case also the deacon's devotion, there is an effect from their prayerful and devoted attention to Mass. It's not magic. This is, again, not just a formula out there. It depends on Christ's grace always. But they do have an effect on the, the free flowing of the grace. There are various actual graces that get messed up by their feud. And it would be good for people in the parish to say, look, you're affecting our ability to pay attention to what Jesus is doing when you're celebrating the Mass. So both of you, settle down. Do we have to call your mothers? If they're still alive. Um, if they are alive, it may be worth doing and uh, get both of them to settle down. Um, that would be good, but you know, it doesn't weaken the reality of the sacrament, okay? All right, let's now take a break. We'll come back with Jim in Michigan and others, so please stay with us. Sacrifice is a profound virtue Catholics can lovingly embrace, especially during Lent. But this year, why not also indulge in something good for your soul? Give yourself the gift of EWTN's National Catholic Register and stay connected to the latest developments and historical traditions of our Catholic faith. Try the register for free today and get it delivered to your home, office, or parish. Get six free issues filled with spiritual insights on world events, along with compelling Catholic news and information. To get your six free issues, order online at ncregister.com forward slash TV or call 800-421-3230 and mention code TV, the National Catholic Register. It's the one indulgence you won't ever want to give up. Order online today at ncregister.com forward slash TV or call 800-421-3230 and mention code TV. 
The National Catholic Register. Read faithfully. So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. James chapter 2, verse 17. Pope Francis journeys to Iraq with a message of hope and peace. EWTN will bring you complete coverage as the Holy Father encourages the faithful, meets with religious leaders, and more. Pope Francis in Iraq, March 5th through 8th, here on EWTN. Right, we have Jim. And where are you calling from, Jim? From Michigan. Great. What part of Michigan? Uh, halfway between Detroit and Toledo. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, down there. I uh, used to live in Detroit and travel down to Toledo every so often. Back when I was in college, they used to call Toledo Venial Sin City. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions about Detroit. So go ahead, Jim. What... Uh, what, what's your question today? If two different priests give you contradictory advice, what, mm -hmm. which one should you listen to? I don't know. Um, uh, you know, the, on principle, uh, find out which one is closest to church teaching. Um, you know what? Uh, do you can you say what the advice is about? Uh, well, it was uh, it was about uh, proper relationships with your wife. Uh, okay. Uh huh. And yeah. In in that case, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, you because. Uh, See, it, I can't answer that in the abstract, and it may not be appropriate for, uh, you know, a conversation in, in public. But um, what I would do in terms of dealing with this is ask each of the priests, you know, what is your reason for this advice? what you base that on so that you can make a good decision. Because you want, uh, you, you can't just say, well, one priest told me this, one priest told me that. Why did he say it? I don't know what he said or why he said it. Find that out and see if that is in line with the teaching of Scripture in the church. Uh, and if one of them is not in line with the church, don't take that advice. If um, they, uh, and you may find that they're going at the problem with the limits of knowledge they have, and they may even need a little bit more knowledge, but you need to find out why they gave that advice. And then you, you can make a better decision on that basis. So I would be, you know, because I know way too little about this case and it doesn't sound appropriate uh, for our conversation right now in this format. All right, we have Mike on the line. Where are you calling from, Mike? I'm calling from Quakertown, Pennsylvania. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it, uh, now, what can we do for you today? Last week you had mentioned that we are built in the image of God. Mm -hmm. and, I, and if God is spirit, mm -hmm. and the angels are spirit, mm -hmm. then we built in the image of God, we're flesh. So I'm trying to put the pieces together. I'm a bit confused. Sure. Now, before Antifa gets to them, 
there are a lot of statues in your fine state, are there not? Yes. And what are they made out of? Stone. Stone and sometimes out of bronze, right? Correct. And there's famous statues of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and George Watt, all those images of the early founders, correct? Yeah? So, okay. All right, yeah. So now, are they the same as George Washington or Ben Franklin? Not when they're a flesh. No, aha. So we can say that these statues are images of Franklin, Washington, and Jefferson and the others. But it's not that person. And it's of a different nature, is it not? Yes. So yeah, yeah, it's I inanimate. But it's something that reminds us of certain elements, say, of Ben Franklin's uh, sagacious qualities. He was a wise man. And they'll try to communicate that in the statue, correct? Okay, yes. Yeah. yeah, but it's not the same as Ben Franklin. Now, we also are in the image and likeness of God. The Bible doesn't say that we are God. We're in his image. And that there is as, uh, there's an even bigger gap that you bring out well. Uh, there's an even bigger gap between us and God than there is between a bronze statue and the actual Ben Franklin. But we still are an image of God. Does that help at all to understand this? That and helps. then, and here's the ways in which we are images of him. We have the ability to know. We have the ability to know that we have choices and we have free will to make choices. In that way, we are like God. So it's the Lord God who says, let us make man in our image and likeness, and the image and likeness of God, let us fashion them. But we're not the same as God. No image is. In fact, in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, they use the word for image, which is the word Tselem, Tselem means image in Hebrew. And they use that for the, as one of the words for movies. Uh, because movies are an image of life, but it's not the actual life. It's an image of it that you project. Well, we are an image of God. And that's, that's all that we're saying. But it's also something that raises our dignity. And that's very important, very important. All right, let us now go over to Tom. Tom, where are you calling from? Hi, Father Mitch, I love your show. Thanks. Uh, I'm calling from Brighton, Michigan. Great, great, good to have you on. Good Michigan calls. And Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, with Our Lady of Fatima asking us to pray uh, for all souls to go to heaven, and with uh, Sister mm -hmm. Faustina and the Divine Mercy Chaplain uh, begging the Eternal Father for mercy on the world and, and mm -hmm. for all of us, mm -hmm. has that led to uh, society as a whole thinking that uh, they'll, they'll answer our prayers and everybody's going to go to heaven? You know, and that, so that idea where everybody's going to go to heaven <sighs> yeah. because of the, the prayers that we pray. You know, uh, here's something to keep very much in mind. Our Lord very much prayed at the Last Supper for his disciples to all be saved. But Judas still had free will to go against what our Lord prayed for and desired. And this is something very important for us to remember. We should pray for souls that are lost. 
that are far from God. Pray for them. I pray for them often. I pray for a lot of the public figures. Sometimes we hear about their various moral problems in the media. And I don't ever want to become like one of these gossip magazines or something. I don't want to be like, you know, pro, I don't even know if it's still on, but the old Jerry Springer show where they sort of, you know, let these people get into these fights and all this nonsense. No, we don't want that. Instead, we pray for these folks. God's great. We pray that God's grace somehow find them. But it doesn't make it happen. They still have to make a decision in their free will to say yes to God or not. And that's something that we, our, our Lord and Our Lady, desire that everybody go to heaven. God, it says in Scripture, in, uh, I believe it's 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, God wills all men to be saved. That's why we disagree with John Calvin's doctrine, because he thinks God predestined some people um, to, uh, you know, go to, uh, you know, hell. No, God wills all men to be saved. But each person has to say yes. Right. To so more of the churches, more of the, more of the priests should preach more on the warnings of hell than. In, a, oh, in her sermons. Well, I know, I know, but I'll, I'll keep doing my best. And um, I'm sort of, by saying the things I said in today's show, I'm trying to encourage that. Uh, even if it means they'll, they won't make us bishops, it doesn't matter. That we get to heaven by being faithful to preaching the gospel of Christ, which includes the warning of, against going to hell. That is more important than promotion. So, yes, you're right. All right. I have another email. This is from Isaac, uh, Isaac, actually. Um, Your Father Mitch, I'm 81 years old, and I've been reading the Bible since age 14. You know, I'm going to try to catch up to you. I started when I was 14 as well, uh, but I, I'm not 81 yet. I have another 10 years. I know that the Bible is an allegorical book and that there are significant problems in translating some words from Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. My question is this. Did God create one man and one woman or several men and several women? I thought about this after reading the conversation between God and Cain after Cain killed his brother Abel. Cain told God that if someone would see him, he would kill him. Who were these somebodies? Well, uh, Isaac and... Um, Newport News, Virginia. Isaac, we don't know who they were. I have a personal speculation that earlier than Homo sapiens, before we existed, there was another hominid species known as, Neand we call them today Neanderthals. I don't know what they called themselves, but they were close to humans and now we know from studying their DNA and our DNA that human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, intermarried with Neanderthal and had children that were part Neanderthal and part human. And I think there's about 5% to sometimes a little bit more in some areas uh, about that much of Neanderthal DNA in our mix. That's well, could be. We know that they intermixed with humans. That, that we do know now um, because, through DNA study. So it may well be the Neanderthal people. I don't know. Uh, the only groups that did not intermix with Neanderthals are people in Africa. The African peoples didn't meet up with Neanderthals. They were up in Europe and Asia but, uh, uh, and the Middle East. And so they met up with them there, and we know they had children together. So that may well be who they're talking about. And then real quickly, um, I don't like to receive communion unless I receive the sacrament of reconciliation. Am I too hard on myself? Uh, maybe. If you committed a mortal sin, you must go to confession. If you did not commit a mortal sin, 
You don't need to go to confession. Mass itself is a means for forgiveness of venial sins. So if it's mortal sin, yes, go to confession for sure. But more venial sin, no, you don't have to. But what I have to do is call this show to a halt because we are out of time. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we can bring you this program and all the other programs for one simple reason. It's brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we'll continue to pay all of our bills too, which are many. And we want to present great more programs to you. God bless you and thank you. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy, next here on EWTN. I'm Tracy Staple. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, final preparations are underway in Iraq for Pope Francis. We'll talk to a priest on the ground in that country. And Father Leo Padalinghug stops by to discuss ministering during a global pandemic and his new mission to buy a food truck. Join us for news from a Catholic perspective. The eleventh station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. Consider how Jesus, having been placed upon the cross, extended his hands and offered to his eternal Father the sacrifice of his life for our salvation. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Father, help us to embrace his gift of grace and remain united with you and with each other. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic.